Most often when we're doing DMEC for Fuchs dystrophy or for bullous keratopathy from any cause, it turns out that most patients are already pseudophagic. They've already had cataract surgery for one reason or another. And if not, then many of those patients who have not had cataract surgery can have cataract surgery combined with their DMEC surgery. These combined phaco DMEC operations are really nice. They're really convenient for patients because instead of having two surgeries per eye, they can often just have one procedure to fix the cataract and the cornea at the same time. And yet, a combination phaco DMEC is not right for everybody. There are lots of situations in which you would want to do the DMEC first. In other words, in other words to do a phacic DMEC. So why would you want to do a phacic DMEC? Well, if you're operating on a really young patient, somebody in their 20s or 30s who has endothelial decompensation, you may want to try to preserve their crystalline lens. Or even in an older person, someone who's 40 or 50 who truly doesn't have a cataract, you might try to preserve their natural lens. Even more commonly, you may be operating on somebody who has their natural lens, but the cornea is so bad, so cloudy, that it makes either IOL calculations impossible, or it makes the phaco component of the surgery really challenging because it's tough to see into the eye to do the operation. So for these reasons, you may want to clear the cornea up first before trying to do anything with the lens in the future. Phacic DMEC, therefore, is an important type of DMEC surgery to be comfortable with, and there are a few tips that may make that operation simpler. This is a phacic DMEC that we did in our office last week, and I just want to review a few little high points that are sort of learning and instructive. Um, the anesthesia is topical, supplemented with one cc of subtenons lidocaine or bupivacaine or both. And I like to use a 1 cc volume because if you use a greater amount of that, you're going to increase your posterior pressure, which makes the anterior chamber even more unstable. This is decimetorexis, which I always prefer to do under air, even in these fake eyes. And you may worry about damaging the patient's natural crystalline lens because you can see with the subtenons block, you often get a little dilation. So there are many doctors who do decimetorexis in these fakic eyes under viscoelastic. But really, I think air is preferred because you have better contrast and visibility. You can see little remnants that would be left behind better. And if you have an AC maintainer, in this case connected to a 60cc syringe held by my assistant who's applying steady pressure, then that keeps the chamber nice and stable and formed. Now I'm refitting the AC maintainer here to balance salt solution and I'm making my iridotomy. This is with a capsulotomy handpiece which comes along with our phaco emulsifying machine made by the Swiss company Ertli. I like using this device to make my peripheral iridotomies because you don't have to go up underneath the iris with some kind of a needle scratch down technique so you don't have to worry about damaging the lens capsule that way. You don't have to grab the iris and pull it out of the eye through a paracentesis and cut with scissors. That's bloody and it's imprecise. Uh, the Trector is a really nice tool for making an iridotomy, but it's a non-reusable, non non it's a disposable instrument which adds costs and time to the operation. But this little capsulotomy handpiece, it just cauterizes a little hole via a diathermy technique in the far peripheral iris. So that gives you a minimum of uh, tissue destruction. You know, there's no bleeding. And you can do it even very simply in a phagic eye. So here we've injected the graft into the anterior chamber. I'm going to remove this bubble which came accompanied with the tissue. And that will allow the tissue to start unfolding. Now, when you use... Um, a DMEC and a fake guy, you're going to have a shallow anterior chamber. So you want a graft that's a little bit smaller than you might otherwise use because there's less room to unfold. You'll notice I'm still using the main wound like I always do to unfold the graft. Typically unfolding is easier in these phacic eyes because there's so much compression between the back surface of the cornea and the anterior surface of the iris. That compression is good and bad. It makes it really easy to unfold the graft, but it makes it difficult to flip the graft in the anterior chamber in case it's upside down. 
And so consequently, using a little bit of a smaller graft will make it easier to flip the graft over if you need to tumble it in the anterior chamber. The other thing you may notice is I have an orientation mark. It's located up around 1130 on the screen here, which is actually supranasal on the patient. Now, for a long time when we did DMEC, we didn't put any orientation marks on the tissue because the best way to determine orientation is through the Motsuro sign. You know, the Motsuro sign is named after one of Garrett Malice's very first fellows, a Greek ophthalmologist named Kiros Motsuros. The Motsuro sign is a, a a technique for checking graft orientation using a cannula to interact directly with the edge of the graft, which is great. It's very reliable. I use it on almost every case that I can. But in these phakic eyes, often you have so much posterior pressure in the chamber, shallow, and you try to go into the eye to check the Motsuro sign, and the eye collapses, and you can't maneuver the cannula over there. So I like to use an orientation mark now, especially for these phakic eyes. And rather than an F or an S stamp, which is sometimes indistinct, maybe the ink is smeared or you have part of the letter cut off. It's also maybe injurious to the cells. It's placed in the paracentral cornea on the graft and so it's there forever and you worry about the damaging effects of that ink on the cells. Instead, this little triangular mark made way out in the periphery is nice. It's sort of half of an arrowhead and it should point clockwise and that indicates whether the graft is right side up or not. So that's how I like to use it and I like using this orientation mark because it tells you whether the graft is right side up or upside down when you can't check the Motsuro sign because the chamber is too shallow. So here we are now we've just inflated the anterior chamber. When we started doing DMEC and fake eyes in Holland with Garrett Mellis, the thinking was you needed a um, to leave a smaller air bubble in the anterior chamber, maybe only 50% of the volume of the AC to prevent a pupillary block. I think that thinking has more or less now been replaced by the idea that these eyes behave very much towards the pseudophagic eyes, as long as you have a good, nice, well-formed iridotomy. So this is the conclusion of the case. This is how we leave the patient. And I think that this is important, a skill to do uh, DMEC and fake guys because you're just going to have lots of young patients who need a DMEC and it really is a advantage to be able to just fix the cornea alone and leave the patient's natural crystalline lens in place. We have patients who in our practice who literally had DMEC 11 or 12 years ago who still have their natural lens who haven't had cataract surgery and to be able to do this sort of precise targeted operation for these people is sort of a nice thing and the tricks for doing that are used a little bit of a smaller graft to use an air pump to keep the anterior chamber maintained when stripping under air so you don't have inadvertent damage to the uh, crystalline lens and to make an iridotomy using in my opinion the best tool which is a diathermy handpiece so i hope these tips make it a little bit easier for you to do dmec in your fakie patients